Budgets, of course, aren't just financial documents, they're political ones as well. And here with their view on the politics of it all, Martin Redcon, he's political columnist for the Toronto Star, Queen's Park, and Scott Stinson, he's columnist at the National Post. Welcome to you two. Thanks, First Scott. time for you, Scott. Nice to have you here. Thanks, Steve. Well, let's ask the obvious question here, which is, did Charles Souza and the Liberal government do enough today, Martin, you first, to ensure NDP sign-on to this budget? More than enough. Uh, the NDP had about seven demands, seven and a half demands. The forgotten half demand was to do everything in a balanced way. And I think the Liberals have more or less done that. In some areas, they've given more, as I said, on on the youth job creation program, for example, on health care, long-term care promises. Uh, look, there's going to be a lot of haggling, and uh, not a lot, a little bit of haggling in the next little while. The, the, the initial haggling took place in the last few weeks. But I think the final decision will be as much political as financial. I think the NDP is really taking stock of where they stand, what the potential gains are of having an election, what the downside are. They're having this consultation that they talked about where NDP operators are standing by for your call, <laughs> right, now your call right now and yeah. to take your money because that's how these things are usually done when you have a consultation. You also do fundraising and take notes and emails and so on. But I think they will be hearing loud and clear, not necessarily from 13 million Ontarians, but from a few labor leaders and the members they represent who will be telling them this is a good time to keep the government alive and get the budget measures passed because they're largely progressive. Scott, your view on whether the Liberals did enough today to allow the NDP to sign on? Yeah, I agree with Martin and, and I think the the telling thing was that when Andrea Horvath got up to speak, she didn't say anything other than these sort of generalities about they want to see more accountability in, in the budget. You know, she didn't have any specific ask in terms of what more they need to see. It was just this general thing of we need some sort of guarantee, but there was no indication of what that might be or even some suggestions of what you want to see. So to me, that suggests they, are, they didn't really have anything left to ask for other than this kind of idea that we want to be sure it gets followed through upon. Well, in fairness, she asked for a 15% reduction in auto insurance premiums. Sure. That is reflected in today's budget, but there's no date no. within which that policy has to be brought in. I mean, that's pretty serious. If we're talking 15% reduction over the next 30 years, that's not much of a commitment, is it? This is true. And I mean, the, the home care guarantee where they wanted a five-day guarantee and they got instead money that's supposed to speed things up. But I, I think what the liberal response to those would be would be these things are were kind of impractical asks in terms of a five-day guarantee. That's not something you can just write down on paper and say, boom, five-day guarantee. Like that requires all kinds of different stuff. And I'm sure major structural changes to the way these things work. So I think what they tried to do was, was say, look, you kind of have a populist way of framing it. We're not able to meet those specific things, but we're going to pour some money into it and we're going to try to get it done this other way. Um, Martin, Andrew Horvath said her proposals are reflected in today's budget, but not with the specifics that she would like. Is that a legitimate criticism? Sure. It's not even necessarily a criticism. It's a perfectly fair observation. She has every right to want to look at the fine print. I think she was given a bit of a heads up of what was coming. And so it's fair ball to say, look, we want to look at what the details are. They haggled for a month after the last budget and then for a couple of months after that. So I think the lesson we learned last year is let's make sure we're all talking on the same wavelength. But I think she's also buying time. I think she really does have to take the measure of her caucus and people out there to ensure that they're all with her if she goes up and props up, if I can use that phrase deliberately, a government that has a lot of baggage that has the stench, let's just call it what it is, of the gas plant stuff that is problematic. No matter how much you try to explain it away or give some, some background into that, it doesn't look good. And so she has to be very careful. The Tories, you were there today, are trying very hard to stick it to the NDP and say, look, you're calling them a scandal-ridden government in the morning and you're going to bring them down, or you're going to support them, I should say, in the afternoon. So they're trying to drive a wedge there. And I think you heard today, a very interesting tonight, um, preliminary explanation from Michael Prue, the NDP finance critic, laying the groundwork for how they are going to explain that, a combination of give them a chance, good things in there. But as to the fine print, that's fair ball. She needs time to look at it. I really appreciate it, I must say, Michael Prue's answer when I asked him, how do you, do, you know, where is the caucus today? And he was very honest in saying, you know, on the one hand, we think about this gas plant stuff and we want to throw them out, but on the other hand, there are union people who are saying, give these guys a chance. We can get some progressive legislation out of them. Mm -hmm. uh, Kathleen Wynne's only been in for three months. We can't very well pull a plug on her after only three months. 
How tortured do you think this caucus is right now, the NDP? I think there must be some of them that are quite. I mean, it's hard to imagine that you could sort of fulminate over something about the gas plant thing. And I mean, whether it's Peter Taubins or other members of the caucus who have been really hammering them on that in question period and in the Justice Committee over and over, and then, you know, turn around and say, but, eh, we're okay with it. So, I mean, it's it's got to be very difficult for those members who feel, and we're hearing from their constituents, that, you know, this government has basically bought your votes, or and this whole thing was, was totally, you know, know, a, a, a joke from the beginning, the way they handled the gas plant thing. So I, I put it this way, it would be impossible to imagine Peter Sherman doing what he did here a few moments ago and then turning around and saying, but we're, we got enough in the budget that we're okay to let them go. I mean, I'm just, I'm sure it must be very hard for some of the members of that but caucus. Not that hard, because the alternative <laughs> sounds tempting, but it could be courting disaster. Not just for whom? For the NDP. Because right now, they are sitting pretty. They have maximum leverage. Look at this show. Look at the budget show today. All, all eyes are on the NDP. They have, uh, they have influence. They have a, a conversation going with, with Kathleen Wynne. They have a Kathleen Wynne who is a relatively progressive liberal premier, more so than Dalton McGuinty, more conversations, more even than Andrea Horvath is willing to have. <laughs> uh, she stood her up for one of them. So it's an unusual conjunction. The stars are in alignment for the NDP. Just clarify that. When you say she stood her up, Andrea Horvath stood up the premier when the sure. premier asked for a one-on-one. -on -one. That's right. Uh, they've had three. And Kathleen Wynne invited her for a fourth. And Andrea Horvath said, I need a firmer agenda before I have the discussion. I think she really understandably didn't want to be seen as being that much closer to Kathleen Wynne and the Liberals. So they have a lot going for them right now. What happens if there's an election? Who knows? It, perhaps it'll be Premier Horvath, perhaps she'll be the third party and there will be a Liberal majority, or as Labour fears, a Tory majority or minority. So the temptations to bring the government down are actually not as attractive as they might seem on first glance. Hmm. The, the NDP, we remember after the last budget, said we're going to hold our powder for the moment, keep our powder dry, consult with Ontarians, and then we'll let you know what we hear. I, is that a genuine thing? I, I'd be honest, I think it's pretty disingenuous because I, I just don't see how a political party really consults with 13 million Ontarians. If, if you were to have a, an open phone line and say, call us at this 1-800 number and let us know what you think, there's no way you would think that it's a representative, uh, you know, viewpoint of the public. It just happens to be the people who pick up the phone and go, yay or nay. So I think it's it's something, obviously, Andrea Horvath, very much light. She said she was going to talk with Ontarians like a dozen different ways today, so she's very big on selling that message. But they sh they clearly must have people in there, whether it's you know economists or other people who could tell them what they honestly think of this budget and whether it does enough to accomplish their goals. They don't really need to hear from the, the public on this. Is it buying time, Martin? Buying time and buying time to look at the polls. There will be polls. There will be quick polling that will tell tell them what the what the initial reaction is amongst the public. But you know you have to be careful with polls because it's all in how you ask the question. What you will find, and what we've seen in a forum poll in the Star a few days ago, is that people are very much behind. No no surprise here. The auto insurance reduction, the auto insurance premium reduction. Now the fine print has to be sorted out. But how do you fight an election on? They offered us 15%. We couldn't quite narrow it down, and so we brought down the government to give you 15% after we promised you public auto insurance 15 years ago and changed our minds. So it's, it's tricky. She's got a good thing going right now. <laughs> okay. Uh, I asked her in the lockup earlier today, Andrea Horvath, that is, who decides? Because the NDP is supposed to be more collegial and theoretically less I'm the leader, do it my way, and more, I'm going to get a sense of the room and see if we can all come to consensus together. Oh, actually, you asked the finance critic that question, and the leader <laughs> intervened. Yeah. It's true, actually, and I, I'm glad Michael Prue got a chance to answer the question today. But she did say, at the end of that answer, it's on my shoulders. She will decide. Do we have any sense about where she's leaning? I, I don't think we do, other than the fact that the, the the signs that we've been given so far are that she's going to decide to keep the government in place because she put out this list. I mean, when you do what she did, which is here is our list, and you allow them to meet you on those demands, as Martin says, it's pretty hard to then turn around and say, well, we're going to turn them down anyway. So because of the way she's handled it, that leads me to, blank, leads me to believe she will ultimately accept this budget. Um, but I mean, she's pretty good at poker in that sense. She certainly gave no indication today, one way or the other, that she had, you know, she was leaning in this direction or that. One party, Martin, we have not talked at all about are the Conservatives. 
And once again, the conservatives, as they did last year, said, even before reading it, we're voting against. Is that a good idea? Well, they, they know that the NDP is likely to support the government. So it's easier for them to be the odd man out. Is it very good, without risking a defeat of the government, perhaps they want that. Is it helpful to Mr. Hudak to be considered to be effectively sidelined yet again, as people accuse him of being the last time? I don't think so, but I think he's caught here. Uh, on the one hand, I think he could have pushed harder for some uh, conservative initiatives in the budget. On arbitration, for example, public service, uh, public interest arbitration is something he wanted. On uh, restructuring government services, and in fairness to him, he did have four meetings with Kathleen Wynne. They get along great. One more than Andrea Horvath. <laughs> and they do get along well. Uh, there's less of a rivalry, I think, in terms of because they have distinctively different ideologies. They're not competing for the same demographic. Mm -hmm. But I, I, don't, I, I feel some sympathy for Mr. Hudak. I don't wish to pile on because I do think he's caught there. I think he could be more constructive in some areas, but I'm not surprised by the ideological constraints that he finds himself and that he's chosen to put himself in, well, for let, example, on unions. Let me follow up with Scott on that because the, the conventional wisdom is that if he plays footsie at all with this liberal government, in an attempt to make the budget more conservative mm -hmm. and maybe get some things like you just mentioned and then potentially vote for the budget, his base would kill him because they despise the liberals so much. Is that a fair point? I think that's a big part of it. And I also think that he's committed to this tack since last year when he, when he did the same thing and said, I'm not going to support the budget. If he didn't support it last year and said, this is a government whose agenda we can't support and which doesn't have the, the major changes that are needed to get the deficit under control, then he can't really turn around and, and be different with it this year. And, you know, I think he's kind of doing what Jack Layton did on the federal scene, where he was the guy who positioned himself off to the side and said, I don't want any part of this liberal government. And nobody really said Jack Layton was unprincipled when he did that. I mean, it, he played it that way, and then eventually, obviously, it was successful for his party. And I think Hudak and, and the PCs have tried to adopt that same tone. It doesn't seem like he's getting that same sort of credit for it anyway. Gentlemen, it's going to be a good May down at Queen's Park. Yeah, well. Keep your eyes open. Let us know what happens, okay? All right. Thanks. Martin Redcon and our good friend Scott Stinson from the Toronto Star and the National Post, respectively. Thanks, guys. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.